Uh, a Century of Crisis in Leviathan. Uh, I'm almost tempted to say I wrote a book about that, uh, or maybe two or three books about that. And uh, my, my first book in this area, called Crisis in Leviathan, published in 1987, written in the early 80s. I worked on this project for about four years. From, that was my main project from about 1981 through 85. And then it took a little while to get it published and, and brought out. But uh, uh, that, that, that's a book that looked at the growth of government, especially the U.S. federal government, from the late 19th century, let's say around the 1880s, it's more or less where I started the book and, uh, and tracked up to the time, the time I was writing in the 1980s. So it's, a, it's about a hundred years period covered in that, in that book. And, uh, and I hadn't intended when I started the project to do it quite that way. Uh, I began that project because in my own teaching and reading about the growth of government and reading what other people were writing, uh, I became convinced that, that the work that was being done by economists and political scientists at that time, that was, that was when the growth of government was just starting to be a sort of hot research area uh, for economists and political scientists. And, and, and uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Washington named Douglas North, uh, although he's an economic historian, was, was also considered among the economic historians as as one of the, the highest authorities on the, on the growth of government and the interplay between government and, and the economy. And so uh, Doug and I talked pretty much every day about our research and our thinking about things in economic history. And, and uh, so I knew what he was doing and what kind of arguments he was making, what other people were writing in the literature. And, and what economists tended to do was, was to think in terms of long-term trends. They try to explain the fact that government used to be much smaller, and over time it had, it had reached a point where it was much bigger. So in a sense, they were, they were posing the problem. That's time, and this is some measure of the size of government. They were, they were going back to some previous, you know, time one here, and uh, finding that that was how big government was, and then they were finding at some, some later time two here, uh, government had, uh, had ended up at this size, and so, you know, connect the dots, and what they were trying to explain was why this, this trend line was sloping upward, uh, pretty much. And that was as much detail as they, they considered in posing the question, setting the issue they were researching in a lot of cases. And, and, and uh, they could suppose, drawing on economic theory and, and other things, that you know, the plausible reasons why the government got bigger uh, might have something to do with, with changes in the structure of the economy, you know, industrialization, urbanization, the decline of agriculture uh, as a source of employment and earnings for people, and, uh, and a variety of other long-term trends that were happening in society and economy. Uh, and in some cases, actually in many cases, they, they related those long-term changes to, uh, to economic theory <clears throat> by relating the, to what neoclassical economists call market failures. Market failures <clears throat> are, arise in neoclassical economics when, when, when the world fails to, to compl comply or agree with the conditions for for perfect competitive efficiency in, in the classroom neoclassical model of perfect competition. So that if you don't have perfect information, right, you know, if there are th some things consumers and producers don't know about uh, that are relevant to their exchanges, if, 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 if you don't have any spillover effects, you know, everybody's got to, got to, fully pay the costs of any activity he undertakes. He can't be kind of creating problems for other people as a result of what he, what he undertakes to do, even though it's gainful for him. 
he may be making other activities more costly for others uh, through in polluting the environment or, or any number of ways that you could create problems and raise costs for other people. Uh, there, there, there may be uh, uh, some kinds of changes in the technology that are not well adapted to competitive production. If people discover technologies that, ha that have what economists call incre increasing returns, as you, as you increase the rate of production, the, the total cost of production keeps falling and falling and falling, other things equal. Uh, that messes up the operation of the perfectly competitive model. And there's, there's some other things that can, that can cause these deviations. And, 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 and neoclassical economic theory, the, these conditions uh, cause uh, the exchanges in the economy to be suboptimal in the sense that resources end up being allocated in a way that does not yield maximum possible satisfaction of consumer wants uh, within the constraints of the economy's resources and the existing technology. So economists would conclude, as, the, as they did starting, uh, oh really starting before World War II, but especially they developed this thinking in the 50s, uh, they concluded that th these market failures uh, create an opportunity for government to intervene in a way that compensates for them in a way that offsets them, like it forces producers who are creating spillover costs for others to take those costs into account when they make their own decisions about what to produce and how much to produce. So you could do that, for example, if, if you're causing costs to rise for your neighbors by spilling smoke out onto their property and reducing its value, well, if the government puts a tax on your production, okay, that, that means that you're going to reduce your rate of, of production and therefore spill less smoke over in your production process onto your neighbors. You're going to move toward an efficient allocation of resources rather than creating inefficiencies by, by these external effects or spillovers. And so th that's just an example. There were half a dozen or, or eventually maybe even a dozen uh, distinct ways in which market failures could arise. And so economists found it very natural when they had been trained in this line of thinking. This was called the new welfare economics when it was developed uh, you know, just before and after World War II. Uh, they knew about this from their training in economic theory, and so they came, came to this research issue and they said, well, if, if government is getting bigger, it's probably because uh, the economy is developing in a way that, that brings to the fore market failures. And government is riding to the rescue and it's, and it's getting bigger in order to do things it didn't do before when these market failures were not so problematic. And that was plausible. That was plausible. And so that, that was one of the main ways in which the early research in economic history attempted to explain the fact that go government got bigger over time. But mo most explanations pitched in that form uh, if they applied at all, only applied to, to changes that were taking place smoothly, like along this trend line. You know, if government had grown steadily like that to get from point A to point B here. But as a historian, I quickly became aware that, that that's not how government had actually grown. So the first problem that I saw in this way of thinking about the growth of government was it didn't account for the actual path that government had followed, the contours of its growth. It didn't, in fact, grow steadily like that. Uh, if, you, if you took the measure of the size of government at intermediate points here, you, you didn't find them lying on this line connecting A and B. You found them deviating greatly uh, at, at certain times. And it was pretty clear that, that government had grown abruptly uh, during national emergencies, particularly during wartime, uh, and uh, also to some extent during peacetime emergencies like serious business depressions or uh, 
uh, perhaps other, other kinds of national emergencies occas occasioned by, say, big strikes, nationwide strikes, sometimes cause uh, the government to intervene in new ways. Uh, uh, in the first half of the 20th century, particularly, this was uh, something that happened every once in a while. Uh, there might be some, some other kind of scare that came along, like the great epidemics that used to sweep uh, the country from time to time. The last one that you can really see noticeably on a mortality chart is the influenza epidemic of 1918-19, uh, which made a steep increase in U.S. death rates, very steep, uh, extremely deadly disease that was carried back by uh, soldiers returning for af after the armistice in World War I from Europe, because that's where it was in 1918. And so they brought it back here, and this was a strain of influenza that never existed in the United States before, so people had no immunities to it, and it, it, was, it was very deadly. Um, so some, something like that is a kind of non-war national emergency, and, and the government took measures to, to deal with this, like, you know, they increased the number of people they hired to, to work in hospitals, and the number of public health doctors, and, things of that sort. So, so there, there could be non-war related, non-depression related emergencies also, although historically that they tend to be less important than the other two types of major national crises. But during these crises, government would, would grow much quicker than its trend rate of growth. And, uh, and, and the reason the economists, it wasn't that they didn't know these things had happened, but they, they were choosing to disregard them in their analysis, in part because they, they had been trained in statistics. And the statistics, if you see uh, a variable uh, that's, uh, that's growing over time, and you take measures of it, you know, your variable is y, and over time here you're, you're taking the value of y, and you find it at different times. It, the, the, the measures look like this. Okay. <laughs> it's like you, you could like almost see a relationship between time and the value of, of the variable y here, uh, and you could use statistical techniques, especially regression analysis, if you may have studied that, and you can fit a, a least squares line that, that is a mathematical description of how the variable tends to change over time. Uh, and still, you see, there's still some deviations between the, the mathematical expectation and the actual value, but they're small, except for this one. Eh? And uh, these are called outliers in statistics. And, and so what economists had gotten in the habit of doing is, is treating these outliers a, a, as just muddying the water. They said, look, we, we, we've identified a relationship here. You know, this is something that is growing at a certain rate that we can measure with the slope of the regression line. And, 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 and this relationship you know, is almost always like the one the line predicts. It, and the fact that there's this outlier out here, there's one year when it was way out of whack, uh, shouldn't deter us from this regularity we're looking for. <laughs> So what they often did with statistical outliers was they, they just threw them out from the analysis. They deleted them from the data set. Okay. So when they were looking at something like the growth of government, what we actually saw in getting from A to B was not the movement along this trend line here, but, well, I don't know if I can erase it, but it doesn't matter. What, what they actually saw, if, say, uh, time number one here was, let's say, 1900, and time number two here was like 2000. Okay. So we got a century of change, and, and, and what we'd find is, uh, let me put a few ticks in here so I know what, where I am. So it's 1925, and this is 1950. And this is 1975. Okay, so what they'd find is that, that we had 
something more like that, you know, uh, which is a messy drawing, but, but the point I want you to appreciate about it is these, these certain abrupt peaks that are clearly out of line with the general tendency. You know, this trend line I drew in here is still a pretty good representation of the overall change in the size of government over time, but there are clearly some, some occasions when government jumps up to a much larger size. Now, it, it does come back uh, every time it jumps up like that to some extent, but if you actually had a good, good graph here of actual measure of the size of government, what you'd find is those, those retrenchments from the big leaps are, are never bringing you back to where you were before the big leap. Okay? And that's what I, in my work, call a ratchet effect. A, ra a ratchet, you know, you may know, it's a kind of wrench you, you use to tighten a, uh, a bolt uh, or something, and you, and you turn it, and it, and it turns one way, and then when you turn it back, it's just loose. It doesn't turn the nut back where you moved it before. So you, you're able to keep cranking the, the ratchet uh, wrench and tighten a bolt by moving back and forth. So a ratchet goes kind of unidirectional. So the ratchet effect uh, is what I call this. You, you know, something is pulling the size of government up. It, it comes back, but it doesn't come back all the way. So it's like a, a nasty rat, rat, ratchet wrench. <laughs> it works. It works in reverse a little bit, but not all the way. Okay? Now, now in our history, it's pretty clear that the main ratchets here were uh, associated with World War One, with the Great Depression with World War II, and, and, and those were the biggies. Uh, there were smaller ones uh, on other occasions, but these, these were much more noticeable, more striking in, in just about any way you measured the size of government. And I, I need to tell you, there are many ways to measure the size of government. Government is not one thing. It's not like measuring my weight every day for the next year. You know, we know weight, a pound is a pound is a pound, and we have a good instrument, the scales to, to measure that. But government is multidimensional. In fact, modern governments have thousands of dimensions in the things they do and uh, the extent to which they do them. And, and some of them are qualitative, so we don't even have anything like inches or pounds that we can use as units to measure them. We have to just use our judgment uh, as historians to say, well, actually, government made a net gain in the laws it was passing for a certain control purpose, for example. So there's, there's no index of like the severity of that kind of law, but but that's why you have to use your brains. You, know, you have to think about what you're doing and what the evidence shows according to various kinds of evidence. Economists like to make their work easy. They like to appeal to things that you can count. Uh, and if you can't count them, they like to invent what they call proxy variables, which are you know, like surrogate measures that they can say, well, if I can't measure what I want to measure, I'll, I'll measure something I think should be associated with it instead, and then I'll use that variable in my analysis. That's very common in uh, econometric analysis to, to do that sort of thing, and, and to do it in a slipshod way, to just kind of assume those proxies are good, and that they are indeed closely associated with what the theory tells you you should be measuring. So uh, very often in, in modern economic analysis, uh, a technique overwhelms substance, and, and in order to use modern techniques, economists are willing to sacrifice uh, substantial correspondence or understanding, I'm, I'm sorry to, to say, and, and they get points for this, actually. They get positive points for being able to do things in a way that, that, that's impressive. Uh, you know, you look at the pages full of equations and and uh, if you don't know the math particularly, you look at it, wow, that looks like science. And a lot of times if you do, knew, do know the math, you read through what the math says and, and you say, well, yeah, that's obvious. 
You didn't need math to show that. <laughs> or you say, that's stupid, you know, that, that can't even happen. <laughs> and so it looks scientific, it looks impressive, but, but often it's a fraud. Uh, not always. I mean, some people are pretty good and pretty uh, serious about this kind of work. And, you know, I trained some people who do this sort of work, and I tried to make them honest and careful and, and, and hard workers. And, and, and for my reason or for divine intervention, uh, they turned out to, to do their work that way. I'm very proud of them. But, but they're not typical. They're, they're extra good economists and econometricians. And uh, a lot of economists are not careful about this. So, so they, they have these slipshod analyses in, 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 in which they kind of make believe, do a quantitative analysis even of things that can't be counted in a reliable, precise way. My, my approach to studying the growth of government was to say, you've got to look at it with all kinds of evidence. If there are things you can count, like the amount of money the government is spending, the amount of money the government is taking in in taxes, uh, the amount of money that, that regulators are given to carry out regulations, by all means look at those. See what those measures tell us. Uh, but if there are things that can't be counted, or can't be counted accurately, or reliably, or precisely, then you use some other kind of evidence. I, I read a lot of court cases over the years, for example, because the law is important. And the law can become more or less uh, severe in the way it constrains people to act in, in their economic transactions. So if you don't know how to understand and interpret the effect of a law, well, you're just leaving out something very important because it couldn't be counted. And uh, you, you also need to understand that just a law in the books doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's like, you know, we have laws, and they're, they're actually posted all over the highways telling us that there are speed limits. Well, everybody knows that doesn't constrain drivers. They routinely, sometimes everybody on the highway is exceeding that posted speed limit. So <laughs> the law in the books is not the reality. So... If you want to learn about the effect of laws in history, you have to learn enough about compliance and enforcement and people's attitudes, and none of this is counted. You can, you can't, you can maybe count the number of cases of prosecution for speeding, but that, you know, that's, that, that's a really poor way to go about it. We could all see immediately why that not, might not be a reliable way to, to gain an understanding of how much obedience the speeding laws receive. So, so in, when you study some historical subject like this, I believe you, you need to look at every kind of rel relevant evidence, quantitative, non-quantitative, qualitative, legal, uh, economic, social, ideological, you know, from what I was telling you last night, ideology is very critical because it may change uh, over time. Uh, steadily, in a trend way, or maybe sometimes abruptly, like the, this measure I've put up here. This is my, my hypothetical measure. Okay? So the, these kind of market failure explanations for the growth of government it, it can't, can't account for the conjure. They can't account for the fact that on some occasions the government grew suddenly. You know, did markets suddenly fail? in a gigantic way, and so the government got big, and then they didn't fail so much, so the government backed off. <laughs> uh, that's not even plausible. And furthermore, if you look not just at some overall measure of government, like government spending, which is what most of these studies were doing, but you looked at a variety of government activities, and you looked at government budgets to see what it was spending money for, it was immediately obvious that most of the money governments were spending had no connection with any plausible market failure or attempts to repair that market failure. They just weren't connected, you know. They didn't have anything to do with air pollution or water pollution or, or the usual suspects for spillover effects. It didn't, didn't have anything, anything to do with public goods or it uh, didn't have anything to do with increasing returns. Uh, it was just it's something else altogether. 
And so there, there, there is necessarily a, a requirement of some additional ex, explanatory variables, and, and, and maybe those market failure type explanations are, are not worth much at all. In fact, I ultimately concluded that you could almost ignore that stuff about market failure and the government growing in order to, to solve market failures because it's such a negligible part of what government increasingly came to do over time. Uh, throw it out. It, it, it actually was a kind of apology for the growth of government more than it was a good explanation. So uh, what, what, is, what is driving things here? Well, obviously, war. <laughs> Uh, war is one of the major drivers uh, of economic growth and certainly of these bursts of sudden rapid economic growth in just a, a few years' time. I showed you some data yesterday on government spending and taxing during World War I and World War II in the U.S., and you can see how quickly it ran up, and you could also see that it, it retrenched afterwards, but not back to the pre-war level. Uh, there was a jump up during the Great Depression. And, and interestingly, although we, we tend to think of uh, the, the Great Depression growth of government in, in connection with the New Deal of Roosevelt, uh, by many measures, the big leap came under Hoover. <laughs> Certainly the, the leap in government spending relative to, to gross domestic product. Now, part of that was because the federal government spent more money in the early 30s, and, and, and a part of it was because the gross domestic product fell so much. So the ratio of government spending to GDP is rising because the numerator is rising and the denominator is falling. So they're both going on. So you can't blame Hoover and company uh, for everything that happened to the ratio of government to GDP, but, uh, but, but the government was spending more money. Now, under Roosevelt, uh, that ratio didn't change very much, actually. The jump up was almost complete by 1933. But a lot of other things changed that don't show up in these quantitative measures. Huge, important laws were passed. Uh, regulatory agencies were created. All kinds of changes in the way laws were enforced and regulations were enforced came into play because uh, uh, some of these people, especially after 1935, who worked in the New Deal, were extremely hostile to, to, to private enterprise and to the market system. They were great believers in government intervention. Uh, they, they were usually people trained in law schools. Many of them actually came from Harvard and had been trained by and sort of sponsored and mentored by Felix Frankfurter. And Frankfurter was a, a, a brilliant young lawyer. Well, by that time he wasn't so young anymore, but uh, starting out before World War I, he was, he was kind of a, a miracle man, a young man at Harvard uh, studying law, and, and then he became a law professor. And during World War I, he got into a position in the government uh, in running something called the War Labor Policies Board. Uh, he was very friendly to labor unions, as anti-market people tended to be in those days. And, uh, and in World War I, the government tried to to placate the unions so they wouldn't go on strike and mess up war production. <laughs> but also because the people in the Wilson administration tended in many cases to be pro-union people. Certainly Frankfurter was. So when his, when his, uh, his, his young protégés came to, uh, to the New Deal in the 1930s, often on his say-so, I mean, he'd write letters saying, you know, Joe Blow is a good, young, pr promising young man. You should find a place for him in, in the government. And, and Frankfurter was not just going to write him into the void. He was a man who could, who could write even to President Roosevelt and expect, one, the president would read his letter, and two, the president would even reply to his letter. So he was, he, he was not a, a schmuck, you know. He was a man who had influence. He had the ear of the president and a lot of people below the president. Uh, he was very close to Justice Brandeis on the Supreme Court, so the two of them together were sort of the leaders of a, of a, uh, of a school of thinking about the market system and the desirability of, of high levels of government intervention, especially through uh, 
regulatory laws and regulatory commissions staffed by the, these young Frankfurter uh, protégés who, who, who were called all kinds of things. They were, they were called the Harvard boys. Uh, one, uh, one guy, uh, George Peake, who was a, a different kind of a big shot in government in those days, called them the boys with their hair on fire uh, because they were, they, were, they were zealous. They were full of energy and activism. They were intelligent. They'd learned a law one of the best law schools, and they were eager to get in there and twist the economy into the form they thought would be for the betterment of society. And just not incidentally, while they were, while they were doing good, they would do well, which is to say they would be the guys appointed to these regulatory commissions to make the decisions. And they felt very comfortable with that. You know, they were not worried about uh, any pretense of knowledge they thought they knew how to run the economy, and they thought this even though these guys, almost to a man, were absolute economic ignoramuses. <laughs> I was telling you yesterday that you know, the, new, the New Deal was just a lot of nutcases. They didn't know what they were doing, but they believed they knew what they were doing. They had a great deal of self-confidence that they, they could do a good job of making the world a better place by substituting their decisions and their judgment for the decisions of producers and consumers in free markets. Uh, you know, there's been so much criticism of this kind of thinking over the past 70 years that, 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 that maybe some of you find it hard to believe that it could ever have been like that. It seems preposterous that people could have believed such senseless things, but, but but they did. You know, this was the reality of life at the higher reaches of government in the 1930s. And, and, and they were at the cutting edge of this. They, they were, these, these Frankfurter boys were probably more important than any other single identifiable group of influential people in, in the New Deal. And, and so they, they had a big effect. And one of their effects, as I, I argued yesterday, was, was to create a lot of regime uncertainty. It was these guys that created the greatest fear among investors and business people that the government was going to turn into socialism or communism or fascism, something totally different from the U.S. free enterprise system uh, with limited government that had existed uh, pretty much from the beginning of the United States history. So, so We've, we've got these episodes during wartime and the Great Depression, particularly, uh, when, 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 when government leaps to the, to the rescue, and it comes to the rescue, you know, handing out all kinds of crutches to make up for, for the legs that's just broken. And, uh, and I found that to be a more appealing way to understand the growth of government than looking at market failures and, and looking at just trends because it explains more and it, it's in agreement with not only with the historical record but with various aspects of the historical record uh, and, and, and it's still good you see you know what to expect uh, when uh, when when my book crisis in leviathan was published in 1987 most of the reviews uh, were quite negative uh, and some, some of the reviews were negative for the usual reasons that, you know, academics hate everything that doesn't say exactly what they think. So I, I got quite a few of those. But, but the, the book uh, was actually reviewed widely in places that are non-academic, you know, like the Wall Street Journal and, and uh, you know, various magazines that, that had some readership among people interested in public policy. And, and what people were saying uh, is that, you know, well, you know, Higgs has this dark view of the future. Like, you know, in the whole book, there's only half a page that talks about the future. <laughs> but that's what many of the reviewers seized on, that half a page, because in that half a page, what I said is that uh, if history continues to follow the logic that it has followed for the past hundred years, then what we can expect is a continuation of, of this pattern, which is to say, when a new national emergency appears, 
Government will react by growing abruptly, and after that crisis passes, that growth will not disappear completely, even if there is some retrenchment. And so this ratcheting effect will carry us to higher and higher levels of government uh, control and activity in the economy. And that just means, you know, the prospects of liberty are very dim. Now, of course, I'd already explained that all of this ratchet effect is contingent on some conditions that might change. And the most important of those conditions was an ideological one. Right? The reason government grows abruptly during a national emergency is because people have adopted a, an ideology, a belief system, that causes them to believe that, that government can and should be the rescuer. It could actually be their, their first resort. Okay? Probably in all times and places, people have thought, you know, if worse came to worse, you know, they'd try to get some help from government. But that, that wasn't always the way they, they thought about problems. Generally in the 19th century, there, there, there were problems, you know, there were business depressions, there, there were epidemics, there were all kinds of things that, that, that were very troublesome and problematic in society, but, but in those days, uh, the dominant ideology was one of limited government, so many people believed, one, that government is incompetent uh, at best and, and, and tends to be predatory, and so you, know, you should always look with jaundiced eyes on government. You, you, should, you should hold it in, in Jeffersonian suspicion. You, know? you should not give it the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but you know, if you're, if you're desperate and, and private measures don't seem to be working, you know, people might say, okay, let, let's, let's allow a little bit of government involvement here because we can't think of anything better. But it was like last resort. Be, with the advent of progressive ideology between roughly you know, eight, 1900 and 1915 was the, the bulk of the progressive era, there, you know, little movements in that direction earlier and little continuations later, but there was a big shift in ideology of the, of the opinion leaders in the United States in that period. So you get people like Felix Frankfurter who are thought leaders, you know, they write for the leading newspapers and magazines, they, they share their opinions with leading politicians and decision makers, they, ha they have ideological clout. Uh, uh, those, those people during the progressive era had largely c come over from the old belief in limited government and laissez-faire and, and government only as a last resort to the progressive belief that the way to make people better off and freer, even to make people freer, was through government. That you look to government first. Yeah. Woodrow Wilson laid this out just perfectly clearly in a, in, a, in a book he prepared when he was trying to get himself elected president of the United States in 1912. This collection of his speeches and essays called The New Freedom. He said, you know, we used to have the old freedom. That was the freedom where we, we wanted to be left alone by government. He says, but now conditions have changed. We have all these giant firms, for example, with all this potential for oppressive power over workers and consumers. And so we, we can't just stand aside anymore and, and, and think that the best thing is to keep government small. We, we need government to go to bat for us. We need government to keep our freedom from being crushed by these trusts, these big corporations, cartels that are you know, out to get us. And many people bought into that and believe it today. Yeah, you read any progressive website and you'll find this, this visceral fear of corporations and visceral hatred of corporations and universal blame, blaming corporations for every conceivable thing that people take to be wrong with society and economy. Right? It's the big corporations that are responsible for it. Well, that, that whole development of ideology is a product of the progressive era. Uh, 
And uh, it was only in the late 19th century that these big corporations emerged in our economy. So this was a reaction to that economic development. And uh, uh, there were many others, but this was probably the most important one, the, the fostering of progressive ideology that has been in place ever since. You know, it, it has its ebbs and flows. It comes under challenge from time to time. But basically, that's been the ruling ideology for a century or more. Now, if you, if you subscribe to that, what you believe is that when you see a problem, particularly when you see an emergency, the first thing you look to is look to government. Government is what you rely on okay, to beat back the, uh, the big businesses and the corporations and, and, and these evil private parties that, that are, are trying to control the world. And, and sure enough, if, if, you, if you act this way, politicians are very happy to respond. <laughs> because even in the beginning, if you go back to the very beginning of the United States, there were some politicians already wanting a lot more power, wanting a lot more control, wanting to to have some role in controlling economic life. So th this was not like news. There'd been mercantilism for centuries. So the idea of government intervention in the economy didn't have to be invented. And, and there were people in early US history who, who subscribed to this kind of thinking. And of course, often it was because they wanted to be the controller. They wanted to be in charge of, of the central bank or they wanted to be in charge of the, uh, of the government owned industry that, that produced something instead of buying from a private firm. Right? Uh, but sometimes people just honestly believe that that was the better way. There's a rule in social and economic analysis when we're looking for who's responsible for, for some change. Follow the money, that's the rule. Yeah? All right. And you can find an old Latin maxim that says basically that. If you want to know who, who committed the crime, ask who benefited. You know? Qui bono is the Latin. Qui bono. Who gains? Who benefits? So uh, it's tempting to always follow the money and say the people who are responsible for bad public policy are, are, are the gainers. You know, they're just trying to use the coercive power of government for their own individual benefit. And that's often the case. So I'm not trying to talk you out of following the money. I urge you to follow the money. <laughs> However, I would urge you not to believe that that is the whole story. And in fact, if that were the whole story, government would not be nearly the problem that it has come to be in modern life. Because remember, ideology is at the bottom. Ideology is even below uh, gain-seeking, the kind of acting and you find uh, when you follow the money. Right? Because, because even if you follow the money, the people who are trying to use the system for their own gain have limitations on what they're willing to do. They have beliefs about what is the proper way for them to, to gain through the use of government power. And many people aren't benefiting at all. They don't even think they're benefiting at all. They just think that there's a social problem, an economic problem, and it's something that government can solve. So they want government to solve it. They, they really believe that. So, so, you know, just assuming bad faith and assuming ideology of the Marxian kind, you know, like a trick that the exploiters use to, 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 to give the exploited people false consciousness, well, that exists, but you know, there's a lot of other things going on at the same time. There's just honest mistakes, uh, ideological mistakes about why the world works as it does. And if there's one single thing that you could fault the, the progressives with from the beginning to the present day, it's that they do not know economics. I mean, virtually to a man and woman they do not understand economics. Okay? Now there are plenty of people on the other side, you know, on the conservative side, the anti-progressive side, who also don't know economics, but there are some people who do. 
So it's not quite so bad there as it is among the progressives. They, they just utterly do not understand how markets work. They're, they're clueless. The ideas they propagate about why things happen in the economy uh, do not hold water. And, and, and even, even at the highest level of progressive thinking, you work your way up to, to Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winner, and what you get in his columns in the New York Times is despicable. It's so ignorant. I mean, I wouldn't pass a freshman in a course who said that kind of stuff. And uh, it's kind of a mystery even. It's so bad that you wonder why he does it. He can't, he can't n not know that that's foolish. But, but maybe he's somehow poked an ideological ice pick in his eyes and blinded himself ideologically so that he's lost his sense of understanding economics in the past 10 years. But for whatever reason, you can go top to bottom among progressives and you find economic ignorance. <laughs> it's vital. You cannot understand the social world without understanding economics. And it doesn't mean everybody has to be an economist. It's not necessary for everybody to be an economist. You get, but you've got to know the basics of economics. If you don't, you are doomed to be at the mercy of people making very fundamentally flawed arguments about why things happen as they do. Now, having learned economics, you won't necessarily be a master of understanding because the world is more complicated than just what you understand from economic analysis. I've been explaining that I tried to incorporate ideologies, which was not an economic topic at all because I thought it was essential to bring it into my analysis if I was going to understand the growth of government. Uh, I still believe that now. Uh, there, there are things you need to understand about how po politics work, about how the political system operates. They're not part of standard economic analysis. So there, there, there are many things about how laws are made, how they're enforced, and so forth. You, you need some understanding of all these things to get a broad understanding of uh, political and social life and of something like the growth of government because this involves uh, an integration of many different forms of, uh, of understanding. So, so I, I have tended to break this subject down in, into, into trend factors and, and crisis factors. But having done that, uh, it's also important to bear in mind that they're not distinct. It's not that there are trend factors going along, making the government a little bigger year by year in normal times, and then a crisis occurs, and the crisis factors take over. That's, that's not the way it works. They interplay with each other. Okay? What is happening during a normal period, for example, sets the scene for how people will react to a crisis. People have to be predisposed. They have to be politically positioned. They have to make connections that will allow them to exert influence when a crisis begins. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on during a normal period. It may look as if government's not growing very much, but, but, but a lot of people are out there laying their plans, you know, getting ready, uh, getting themselves connected properly waiting for their opportunity to arrive. And uh, they understand, as Rahm Emanuel said, that you don't want to let a crisis go to waste. Okay? They, knew, they knew that already. And so when, when, when the World Trade Towers are knocked down, the Bush administration guys are in heaven. <laughs> kind of bizarre to say that, isn't it? Well, you know, what's 3,000 American deaths to those guys? It's an opportunity for them to do what they wanted to do and couldn't do because of political opposition before. Now, everybody's scared. They're fearful. And that's when the crisis can be exploited to the max. The more afraid the mass public is, the more they will submit to, willingly acquiesce in great, extraordinary government measures. If you, if you go back and look at what happened to the public polls about President Bush just before and just after the 9-11 attacks, it's amazing because, because Bush wasn't very popular. His, his administration was waffling. It wasn't going anywhere in particular. Uh, 
A lot of people despised it. Uh, and, and, and then along comes this, this attack. And a week later, there's overwhelming approval of President Bush's actions in office, his actions for national security. Isn't that crazy? You know, this thing happens and he's given great credit for national security management. It's like the more you fail in public policy, the more you're rewarded. Uh, so, so people suddenly pour all this approval and approbation on the president, even, even in areas where he was a manifest failure, I, I, even in areas that were unrelated. If you look at what people thought about his management of the economy, you now people think the president manages the economy. Uh, he wishes you know, he managed the economy. But, but they, they had a you know, mediocre opinion of Bush before that attack. Afterwards, it's like 80% plus approval of Bush's management of the economy. Just absurd changes. But what this does is give the major political actors an opening they didn't have before. Now they can go in, they can, they can pass something like the USA Patriot Act, which you know, had been sitting on the shelf at the Justice Department, pretty much in the form it was passed, for years. These guys are always wanting, wanting greater powers to spy on people and to, and to get information without warrants and so on. They, they had already written out the legislation <laughs> to give themselves those powers, but they hadn't been able to overcome opposition from other powerful forces in the government. But now they, they have an opening because that resistance dissolves when people are scared, they're afraid, they're uncertain of what the future holds. And so that, that, that gives a government the opening to grow. Now, now look what we're, we're doing here. We're relating what had happened before a crisis to how people react when the crisis comes. What specifically they do, what they, what they put in place. A lot of it you know, not invented on day two of the crisis, but invented long before, desired by some people long before. But normally there's a lot of blockage in the political system. No matter what you want to do, there'll be some people that are, will oppose it. And so for, for the most part, people don't get what they want. You know, they push for something, other people push back, nothing happens. Or maybe they end up a little bit happens. They're trying to push over here, and all they're able to do is push a little bit. Right? But in a crisis condition, they're able to push far. But it depends on the pre-crisis preparation, including the preparation of public opinion. Right? If, if you wanted, say, to, to nationalize airport security, what you should do is, during perfectly normal times, when no airplanes are hijacked, uh, and there, there are no great emergencies, what you should do is you know, keep introducing legislation, keep publicizing the dire need for, for government to manage airport security. Uh, if you do that, even if it doesn't become law, if it's never adopted, if it never gains even majority approval among the public, you make people aware of it. You, you soften them up so that when you come back with it during the crisis, it's not like something they've never heard of. Right? People are more likely to resist some, some outrageous intrusion on their liberty if it's like totally out of the blue right? than if, well, you know, somebody's been talking about this, proposing it, working on it for years. So the, 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 the work that goes on among interest groups and, and opinion leaders and other influential people in government is happening in the non-crisis periods, preparing the ground, right? preparing the ground for what will only be, be attained when there's a crisis, when there's mass fear, when there's a letdown of resistance. Right? Now, every crisis passes, even though uh, some people, uh, such as uh, the neocons and, and Dick Cheney and uh, Paul Wolfowitz and these guys would, would like to have the war on, t on terror be the permanent crisis, you know, the, the crisis that never passes. 
as Cheney said, th this is the new normal. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe it will be, but I, I don't think so, because it's in inherent in the way people think that they can't keep themselves at a fever pitch of fear forever, especially if nothing is happening to reinforce that fear. Right? So, for example, during the Cold War, the military-industrial complex wanted to keep people constantly afraid of the Russians and being attacked. And a lot of people were afraid, and for that reason they supported the maintenance of this gigantic armed force and all these military bases scattered around the world and, and the rest of it. Okay? But if you went for several years and there were no diplomatic crises with the, with the Russians and and there was no big international incident, there was, there was no little regional war uh, cropping up between their allies and our allies. Uh, pe people stopped being so afraid of the Russians. They didn't have this fear of war with the Russians at the forefront of their minds anymore. And so after a while, when the Pentagon came in wanting a lot more money this year, as they did every year, the people would say, they don't need, they don't need this extra money. You know? What is the big problem here? They've got plenty of money. From the amount we gave them before is doing the job. Okay? We're, we're keeping the Russians at bay. They don't need any more money. So to allay that, uh, the, 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 the Defense Department and political leaders w would either you know, look forward to a new crisis, they would hope for, for one to come along, and if one didn't come along, they would manufacture it. Uh, they would make it up basically, out of whole cloth. Uh, they, would, they would invent, as they did in the very end of the 1950s, a, a missile gap. A missile gap. Supposedly, you know, if you, you went around and you looked at, at, at Jack Kennedy's campaign in 1960 for the presidency, he's criticizing Nixon, he's running against, uh, who had been the vice president under Eisenhower, uh, in the preceding eight years, and he said, these guys allowed the emergence of a dangerous missile gap. The Russians have all these big, powerful missiles, and they have more than we do. You know, they can outgun us in nuclear war. You know, like the, the lunacy of this didn't quite sink into people. <laughs> like, you know, they, they have 100, 150, and we have only 140. Uh, as if, you know, if you, if you lose to even 10 of these big nuclear weapons on, on a country, it would be devastating. But, you know, they're worried about the fact that they, they have more, or they, they, their missiles have a little more thrust, or, or a little more accuracy or something, so there's a missile gap. And that was a big issue for Kennedy, and faulted, faulted Nixon, and he won that election very, very narrowly. So, you know, it might well be that that was an issue that helped him get elected. And without it, he would have lost. You know, and without his father faking the vote in Chicago, he would have, he would have lost too. <laughs> so it's important to have a wealthy political mover and shaker as your father when you go out to get elected to public office. So, so anyhow, uh, the, this missile gap was one of a series of, of, of gaps the, the Pentagon was always inventing or political leaders were inventing. Late, later on, they had an anti-missile gap in the... In the late 1960s, and, and then later on they had a, a missile throw weight gap because the Russians had built some of these gigantic missiles that could lift more weight than the biggest U.S. missiles. <laughs> and, you know, it's like their missiles could, could throw ten warheads uh, into play and ours could only throw five, so that's a big deal. Again, you know, this is, this is insane that they were talking about levels of destruction that were far beyond anything that could be endured already. You know, they're, they're into the lunacy margin uh, in this debate, but, but people didn't understand this. You know, pe people aren't experts on nuclear war. They, they live their lives. They just read a little thing in a newspaper. Oh, there's a dangerous defense gap here of some kind. Our missiles aren't as good or as numerous as the other guys. 